presents... Come in. Welcome. I am Tammy Grimes. As long as there are haves and have-nots, givers and takers, the affluent and the less fluent, there will be those whose only way of competing is to rob. Whether it is personal goods, industrial secrets, state or national secrets, whatever can be clandestinely stolen and sold will be. For every new kind of hold-up or heist, there is a new method of detection. For every spy, a counter-spy as we hope to illustrate in today's mystery trauma. What are you doing in my house? Mr. Parker, I was waiting for you. How did you get in? By the back door. It was open. Let me identify myself before you call the police. Inspector Michael Fogg, sir. Wimbledon Police. I show you this picture. Do you know this person? Well, yes, I do. His name is William Jackson. He's a very good friend. But why do you ask? Mr. Parker... Your very good friend has been murdered. Our drama, The Fifth Man, has been written especially for the Mystery Theatre by James Agate Jr. and stars Norman Rose. I shall return shortly with Act One. known in CIA, NKVD, and MI5 circles as the fifth man. Briefly, there were four before him who sold classified British information to the Soviet. He was number five. We will meet him. But first, meet Everett Parker, magazine editor who has just boarded the 8AM Express from Brighton to London and opens a compartment door to find two men in a heated argument. I tell you, I haven't got it. I don't know where it is. You promised to deliver it this morning. I mislaid it. You'll have it tomorrow. Shut up. Hi. Hi, Everett. Made the train again, I see. Yes, with a skin of my teeth. Managed to catch the lost car and walked up through a corridor. Well, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting. Not at all. This gentleman and I were just going over the cricket results. You know, that sort of thing. Well, if you excuse me, I think I'll get myself an eye opener. Which way is the bar car? Generally, the first car behind the engine. Thank you. I'll, I'll be on my way. That's a rude character, isn't he? Do you know him? Is he a friend of yours? No, but I seem to remember him. That uh, red face isn't forgettable. You know, I told him this compartment was taken. A friend of mine and I generally ride in this compartment alone. Half a year's. That's too bad, he said. I've paid for my ticket, and I'm entitled to sit wherever I like. <laughs> it was just about then when you came in. I must have misunderstood completely what you two were talking about. I never saw the man before in my life. Oh, I have. I'm trying to think where. Have a good weekend, Ev. Oh, Bill, it was too good. Too relaxing. Read some fascinating accounts of Blerio in the early days of flying. I think I'll assign one of our writers to write it up for the magazine. But the chances those early pilots took... People don't dare the fates like that anymore. It made me realize what I'm doing, putting out that little airplane magazine, is pretty small beer. Oh, Ed, what are you talking about? The last issue was tremendous. I sent it round to all the boys at the war office, and Sir Robert kept it for days. Oh, really? So my views on air warfare may have some influence. I wouldn't be surprised. Speaking of small beer, I have suddenly developed a tremendous thirst. You, Tom Teetotaler, at eight in the morning. So, if you'll excuse me, Ev, I think I'll wander up to the bar car. Obviously, he was going forward to meet the man I'd found in the compartment. Mondays are always difficult at the magazine. Material piles up over the weekend, but that didn't surprise me. What did was a message on my answering machine when I got home. Would I please hurry over to the Brighton Hospital? Nurse. Yes, sir. My name is Everett Parker. I have a message to come to the hospital. Oh, yes, Mr. Parker. We have a patient who's been asking after you. Francis. 
Oh, my Lord, not again. Don't tell me. Oh, hello, Everett. You got my message? How do you feel? Not too badly. I had a good night. You've been in the hospital since last night? Oh, since yesterday morning. I, I, I fell down those cellar stairs again. Francis, Francis, let's, let's not talk about that. Does Bill know? He should. I mean, does he know that you're in the hospital? I rode into London with him this morning. He didn't say a word about you. Well, why would he? Oh, Francis, this is terrible. You you can't go on like this, married to a man who... That is, I don't want you to talk about it. This is the second time you've had to come here to be treated. Perhaps. Well, isn't it? Well, I must be accident prone. I mean, I keep falling down at home. <laughs> I don't believe that. I never have. I don't care what it is. Frustration, anger. He must not be allowed to lay a hand on you. He doesn't. He... It's really not his fault. Well, whose fault is it then? Look at you. Your arm is bound up. Is it? Is it fractured? Is it broken? Oh, your eyes black and blue. To see you like this in the in the hands of that that maniac, it's unbearable for me. Do you understand? It'll be all right. It'll never be all right. Now, I've decided. I either go to the police about this or talk to him myself. But I'm not letting this go any further. Now, Francis, you want me to do something, don't you? I guess so. I know so. Why else would you leave word for me to come to the hospital? Because I didn't have anyone else I could turn to. When are they discharging you? Not for another day, I think. Fine. I'd rather you didn't go home until I've had all this out with Bill. If he can't control himself, something will have to be done to protect you. Thank you, Everett. I'm so sorry to put this on you. I really am. I went directly to Bill Jackson's house. It was dark. I knocked. I rang the bell. Rapped at the windows. No answer. The next morning, he was not on the eight o'clock. That night when I got home, I opened my door to find an unannounced visitor. Good evening, Mr. Parker. What are you doing in my house? I am waiting for you, sir. I don't mean that. I mean, how did you get in? By your back door. It was open. May I identify myself before you call the police? I think you'd better. Inspector Michael Fogg, sir. My ID, Wimbledon Police. Well, what do you want from me? Information about a person by the name of William Arthur Jackson. Uh, Inspector, you may remove your hat and coat and sit down like an ordinary person. Tell me, do you chaps always wear a raincoat even when it's not raining? Mr. Parker, do you mind if I ask the questions? It has come to our attention... You may have been the last person to see Mr. Jackson alive. Do you mean he's dead? Yes, sir. We have reason to believe he may have been murdered. Oh, good Lord. You did know him? Well, oh, yes, certainly. When did you last see him? Oh, yesterday morning. We rode into the city together on the 8 o'clock. The Brighton London Express? Yes. Shared a compartment as we have for over two years. You're quite aware of that. Well, I didn't know my life was such an open book. When it's a case of murder, one asks a great many questions. How did Bill die? He was discovered lying beside the tracks three miles this side of Charing Cross Station. Oh, my Lord. Well, could he have jumped from the train? Possibly. He could also have been pushed. Has the war office been informed? Ah, oh, then you know he worked for the war office. Oh, yes. Also know his bureau chief, Sir Robert Leeds. He happens to have contributed to my magazine. And that would be... Airspace. Oh, I see you've done your homework, Inspector. William Jackson and I were more than casual acquaintances. As I said, we've ridden that train five days a week for over two years. Would you be good enough to tell me what you remember of that last train ride? And I'll try to recall as much as you can. Your testimony could be quite crucial to this investigation, as well as establishing your innocence or guilt. Oh, Come now, Inspector. You're not saying that I'm suspected of pushing Jackson off the train. At this point, anyone and everyone is under suspicion. Please proceed. Tell me what occurred that morning. I told the Inspector that William seemed in a good mood. I mentioned the man with the red face, whose identity still escapes me, and that I'd followed William to the bar car, where I found the two of them arguing. The inspector took it all down, thanked me, and said he'd return in a few days. I went directly to see Frances, Mrs. Jackson. Everett, I'm so glad you came over. I'm glad you're home from the hospital. Are you feeling better? Yes. Better and worse. And frightened. The police were here. I didn't know what to tell them. A nice inspector who wanted to know why Bill might have jumped. Well, I had no idea. And if he didn't, then why would anyone want to push him out? 
Anything else? How well did I know you, and were we good friends? I said we were. Everett, who could have done such a thing? Well, the impression I got is the police think it might be me. You? Oh, Everett, that's terrible. You, of all people. Why do they suspect you? What did you tell them? All that I know. There was a man in the compartment when I got there. He and Bill were talking, and then later both of them were having angry words together in the bar car. You know the man? I think so. I know him from somewhere. Well, then they left the bar car. They didn't see me. I ducked behind a newspaper. I thought they were going back to the compartment. So it's still an open question. Did Bill fall? Was it an accident, or was he pushed? Francis, he did not fall. There is no way anyone could fall out of the train between the cars. They're locked to one another with a concertina passageway. Somebody opened the outer compartment door... The and one you were light from at the station. ...and forced him out. Mm. Since I was sharing the compartment with Bill, that's why I am a prime suspect. It's a little unnerving. Why only you? What about that other man? And having a hard time making anyone believe he existed. He had a very red face. Heavier than I am. Older. Does he sound like someone Bill had dealings with? Oh, Bill had rather a life of his own, you know that. For one thing, his work at the war office was very secret, and then there were people he spent time with he never introduced me to, or brought home. It was one of the things we thought about. Why he wouldn't take me into his confidence. I knew he had another life, but he kept denying it. What made you so sure? Well, he couldn't account for hours and days of his time. He'd pack up and... Not tell me where he was going or when he'd be back. Couldn't it have simply been some project for the war office? The last time he was away, I called the war office and I spoke to Sir Robert. He said Bill had asked for leave. And he was surprised that I didn't know where he was. So you see, Bill could have had dealings with half a dozen red-faced men and I'd know nothing about it. Of course, the two of them meeting on the train could have been a coincidence and nothing to do with Bill's death. Why do you say that? That's what I hope. If that red-faced man had a hand in it, then he knows I saw him and I would give evidence he was on the train. So he might not hesitate to do away with me as he had Bill. It wouldn't be safe for him to let me live. Oh, no, Everett. Now, wait. Carl Carson. That's who he is. I, I remember now. He had a beard then. See, what do I know about him? Yes, he owns a private airport and rents planes. Carl Carson. I knew it had finally come to me. Is that his name? The red-faced man? Perhaps not, but that's the name he uses. Now, if Carl Carson has committed murder, it wouldn't be difficult for him to hop into one of his own planes and get out of England. Then they'd have a devil of a time finding him and bringing him back. Well, Everett, don't be hasty. You're implying this man is guilty, but there's no proof. You didn't see him do anything. Ah, but I know Carl's history. Well, just the same. When you talk to the police, you should make it clear there's a very big if... I mean, supposing after all this they find out your man is innocent and someone else is guilty. This may be the occasion to quote Blackstone, who said, It is better ten guilty persons escape than one innocent suffer. Frankly, at this stage... Of the plots unfolding, I haven't a clue who is guilty of murder. But I hope, along with yourself, to learn more when the curtain rises shortly in Act Two. A man has been killed and thrown from a moving express train. His widow is not weeping for her deceased husband. A magazine editor is suspected of having had a hand in the death. And he believes another man is involved. A man with a red face. Mr. Parker, I appreciate your assistance in identifying this man you allege was on the train. Allege, Inspector? But there is a more important matter that concerns the department. We're on the point of holding you as a material witness. Mind you, you're not being accused of the crime... Although we have reason to believe you may have a motive. You come to my house to tell me this? I came for a statement. Before I call my attorney, would you mind telling me how you have come to such a conclusion? A rather clear case of chercher la femme, I would say. Well, would you mind repeating that in English? The lady, sir. 
We have evidence that supports a theory of your interest in Mrs. Jackson. And we have witnesses who have confirmed it. May I be told what they have said? I don't have the transcript at hand. But the sum total appears to be that Mr. Jackson had become increasingly angry over your attentions to Mrs. Jackson. And that is why he was so severe with her physically. Inspector, if I am formally brought up on this ridiculous charge, I shall use every legal means I can to sue the department for illegal arrests, false statements, and impugning my character. Now, if you will be so good as to hand me my telephone, I would like to call my attorney. My attorney told me to keep cool, cooperate fully, and he would keep tabs on what evidence was being collected. I drove out to Cheshire, to the airfield out of which Carl Carson's air livery operated. Anyone here in the office? Oh, I didn't see you. Well, what could I do for you? I'd like to rent a plane. Well, you'll have to talk to Mr. Carson. I'd like to. Okay. Mr. Carson. Yes, who is it, Olivia? Man out here wants to rent a plane. Uh, what's his name? What's your name? Uh, Everett Parker from Airspace Magazine. I heard that. I'll be right out. Be right out, Mr. Parker. I didn't expect to see you here. I didn't expect to see you on the Brighton Express. It's been a long time, Carl. Uh, can we talk alone? All right, Olivia. Come on, buzz off. Yes, sir. Harry, leave that door open. I can watch your field. Yes, indeed. It's a long time. What do you want with me, Parker? What did you want with Bill Jackson? I think that's none of your business. What was it Bill Jackson did not deliver to you? <laughs> I don't know what you mean. That morning when I came into the train compartment, what was he holding out on you? You are nosy, aren't you? Always was, I remember. But you always talk too loudly. Not only in the compartment, but in the bar car. Just like the old days. I suppose it isn't news to you that Bill Jackson is dead. Well, why do you say that? Well, sure, it's new. You didn't know anything about it. I've been out of the country for a week. I just got back. Yes, when you thought things had cooled down. Look, will you stop talking in riddles? You knew Jackson. Yes, yes. He used to weekend abroad, enjoy himself, used to one of my flying wings, if I remember. But you didn't know that he was murdered. Smashed on the head or strangled and pushed off the train three miles out of Charing Cross Station. Oh, I didn't have anything to do with that. I didn't expect you to admit it, Carl. But I came here to tell you that I'm going to be watching you very closely from now on. So don't try anything you wouldn't like to be arrested for. What's with that bloke? Comes in here to run the plane. I just saw him drive off. I'll give you the next time that gentleman shows up, I'd like to arrange a little demonstration. What for? Demonstrations were just for those who tried to get in our way. Now, you've described Mr. Parker exactly. Remember, now, should he appear again, I think we should show him how our propeller self-starters operate on the flying wings. Of course, we'll have to be careful. As you know, sometimes these nosy parties get so interested in these new devices, they stand too close to the propeller. We can't have that, can we? Sir Robert, we've talked a few times on the telephone, but it's a pleasure for me to meet you in person. Is this your very first visit to the war office, Mrs. Jackson? My very first. Bill never offered to show me around, and I never insisted. Oh, Mrs. Jackson, may I express my personal sympathies? Your husband was a dedicated servant in His Majesty's service. He will be missed. Now, is there anything I can do? I've brought something that I believe belongs to you. I have it in my handbag. This little notebook. Please take it. Ah. Uh, where did you say you got this, Mrs. Jackson? I didn't say yet. It does belong to you, doesn't it? You are going to tell me how it came into your possession. I suppose now that Bill's dead, it can't hurt him anymore. Tell me, have you looked into this notebook? Yes, and I have a pretty good idea how dangerous it is. Do go on. Bill used to get up before me. He'd have a quick breakfast and run down to catch the eight o'clock. 
One morning I woke up when he was getting dressed. And I saw this notebook fall out of his pocket. This was in your husband's possession? Yes. I saw all those names of all those people in the different countries. And I guessed what it must be and I hid the notebook. And that night he came home and asked me for it. I said I hadn't seen it. He hit me so hard that I ended up in hospital. He'd do that, you know, flare up, uncontrollable. I I never saw Bill alive again. Well, this is very serious, Mrs. Jackson. I'm afraid I shall have to ask you to remain. You mean here? For how long? That I can't say. Stanton, I'd like you to come in, please, and bring the machine. I haven't done anything wrong, have I? That remains to be seen. I've never told a soul about this, not till now. I knew they were names of our intelligence people in those communist bloc countries. I knew it right away. How did you know that, Mrs. Jackson? Because I, I guess I really should tell you everything. Uh, Stanton, start your machine, then sit over there and take notes. And, oh, give, give me the microphone. Yes, sir. This is Mrs. Frances Jackson, widow of William Arthur Jackson, formerly in the employee of the D2 section... Intelligence Division, the War Office. And Mrs. Jackson, we will continue at the point where you told me how you knew the notebook you have just handed me, which was in the possession of your late husband, contained a spy inventory. Are you recording what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Now, please, go ahead, Mrs. Jackson. My husband and I had several quarrels over the past six months, during which he frequently hit me. He frightened me so much that I never told anyone what these quarrels were about. Not even our very best friend, Mr. Everett Park. Uh, would you mind spelling that name, please? E-V-E-R-E-T-T. P-A-R-K-E-R. Although Everett, uh, Mr. Parker, had seen me a few times pretty badly bruised, I never told him why or what it was about. Well, Mrs. Jackson, what was it about? Suddenly, about six months ago, Bill seemed to have a lot of money. He told me he'd had a winning streak. First it was the races, and then the football pools, then the races again. And then there was that telephone conversation. You overheard the telephone conversation of your husband. We have an extension telephone in the bedroom, and I wanted to call my mother. And I had picked up the bedroom phone, and I could hear Bill talking on the downstairs phone. And he said, No... Names of plans I can't get, but names of people I can. And then I heard him say, Francis, is that you on the upstairs phone? I can hear you breathe. Well, of course, I was frightened to death. I hung up quickly, and I locked myself in the bathroom, and he came upstairs and he pounded on the door, and then the phone rang, and he went to answer it. And when I came out, he had left the house. How did you associate that experience with this notebook? He used to joke about the four men who had spied for the Soviet, sold our secrets to them, you know. There's always room for the fifth man, he'd say. And I knew he wasn't just joking. He was testing me to see how I'd take it. And then one day, I found a letter with the number five under the doormat. The next day, it was gone. So you presumed your husband had removed the letter... And that he was indeed the fifth man. I hated to believe it. But I knew it was true. I... Oh, Sir Robert, I... This is so painful. Could I stop now? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That, that will do for our first session. Uh, Stanton, take the tapes and have them transcribed. And arrange for Mrs. Jackson to have a 24-hour protection. I'm placing a 24-hour guard around you because... Well, my dear lady, undoubtedly, enemy agents will have you followed, and I don't wish any harm to come to you. Is that really so? Right here in England, in peacetime, there are enemy agents? Oh, yes. We're not the only ones who plant agents in other countries. There's a right under our noses here. Shall I stop the recorder now, Sir Robert? Uh, by, by all means. Mrs. Jackson, 
We shall get a message to you by hand to arrange for a further taping session. But I could call you as I used to when Dell worked here. Don't use your telephone to call me. There's a 100% probability that it's not a secure phone. Not secure? Now we must assume it has been tapped by those with whom your husband had dealings. Now, you mentioned Everett Parker, a friend. I know him. Don't talk to him on your telephone about coming here. Don't say anything to anyone about your husband's death. But people will call me to extend condolences. What do I do about that? Accept the sympathy matter-of-factly. But if they ask what happened, how did it happen, don't volunteer any information. I understand. The average person has no idea how ruthless agents can be. Uh, Stanton. Yes, sir. I want a lady operative to guard Mrs. Jackson. Uh, Miss Davis will do nicely. Yes, Mrs. Jackson, as soon as Miss Davis can be rounded up, she will leave with you and remain with you by your side at all times until further instructed by us. Now, uh, good day. And again, thank you. Mr. Parker, if you knew all this, why didn't you speak up sooner? My dear Inspector, what a short memory you have. Right in my house, I told you about Carl Carson, but the department had already made up its mind that I had done away with Bill Jackson. Yes. How far is Carson's airfield from here? Sit tight. We'll get there as fast as I can. My head will roll for this if I don't apprehend the right party. When did you finally decide that Carl Carson was your man? When we lifted a set of his fingerprints from that compartment door handle. Well, how did you know they were his? Uh, regulation left over from the war. All the people connected with the private airport, owners, managers, pilots, maintenance, so forth, must be checked. Their fingerprints are on file. We ran Carson's through the computer, and there he was, up in Cheshire. I knew him during the war. There were some shady transactions involving stockpiles of unused weaponry, which found its way into the wrong hands. He had good lawyers who got him off with a six-month suspended sentence, but evidently that never stopped his accreditation. Parker, when you saw him up at his airport, what did he say when you accused him of complicity in the murder of William Jackson? He as much implied it was my word against his. His word, hmm? I'm afraid that might not be good enough. Countless experts in the law agree with the premise that they have never known a guilty person to plead anything but innocence. Admission, one way or the other, seems to have nothing to do with clean hands or dirty work. To sort it out, to arrive at the truth, we rely on evidence. Scientific and sworn to facts and juries. And even they sometimes can be mistaken. I shall return shortly with Act Three. <laughs> Inspector Michael Fogg is about to make an arrest in the case of the Crown against an unknown assailant. The evidence he has is as conclusive as fingerprints can be. Theorizing that the killer throttled his victim, then opened the compartment door and pushed the body from the train, those fingerprints that obscured all others must point to the murderer. Inspector Fogg and Everett Parker have just pulled into that private airport in Cheshire. Is Mr. Carson in? Hello. Aren't you the gentleman who was here just the other day? Yesterday. Uh, I don't think Mr. Carson's on the premises. Why don't you make sure? I'm sure. Will you tell Mr. Carson that Inspector Michael Fogg of the Wimbledon Police would like a word with you? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Carson, there's an inspector from the police to see you. What? Oh, you mean, is, he, is he near you or is he outside? I'm right here, Mr. Carson. I suggest you come out quietly. I further suggest when you do that you raise your hands in the air. Oh, no. Is your name Olivia? Yes, sir. If you will stand against the wall, Olivia, you won't get hurt. Yes, sir. What's this all about? Uh, I'll put my hands up, but it's only in self-protection. You're the inspector. Keep them up. 
Mr. Parker, do me a favor and search the gentleman. Now, just a minute. He's very high-handed. Oh, I think you owe me some verification that you are who you say you are. Certainly. See for yourself. I think this identifies me. And this pistol, which I find strapped to Mr. Carson's leg, I think identifies him. Inspector, you'd better take charge of it. Oh, thank you. Just, just a moment. I have a license to carry out. If you have, the gun will be returned to you. You are Mr. Carl Carson. Uh, yes, yes, I am. You are under arrest. Charged with involvement in the death of William Arthur Jackson on the 10th of this month during the run of the 8 a.m. express train Brighton to London. On oh, what evidence am I being charged? Your fingerprints have been found in the compartment shared by Mr. Jackson and Mr. Parker here. You are entitled to advice of counsel, and as soon as we return to headquarters and you have been booked, you will be permitted one telephone call. You're making a big mistake. I had nothing to do with his death. I had nothing to gain by it. Oh, even that man standing next to you had more to gain than I did. I suggest you calm yourself, sir. I shouldn't like to have to resort to handcuffs. If you maintain self-control, we can all have a pleasant ride back into town. No, no handcuffs. I'll be all right. You are entitled to as much protection under the law as anyone in England. And if we have made a mistake, you may be sure we shall acknowledge it. <laughs> Do you know, Francis, I hadn't ridden on a carousel since I was a child. Whatever gave you the idea to come here? Necessity. I had to talk to you, Everett, and I thought, sitting on this double seat with you, we couldn't be overheard. I saw Sir Robert. I told him I suspected Bill of being number five. Number five? What does that mean? And to remember those four traitors who sold out to the Soviet. I believe Bill was the fifth man, and that is why he was killed. By the Soviet? For something he did, they didn't like. Or or perhaps they thought he was a double agent. I've read about that. You might have added another piece to the puzzle. This Carl Carson I told you about, he could have been a group leader or possibly a courier. Something went wrong and he had his orders. You think he did it? He was on the train. They found his fingerprints smudged over everyone else's on that door handle. They stopped Bill in his tracks. Everett, they could also stop me. Why you? They might figure I know too much and I'll talk. I have already. What did Sir Robert advise you to do? Well, not to use the phone. It's probably tapped. You see that woman over there by the cashier's booth? She's carrying a gun. And that's Miss Davis. She's my bodyguard. Everett. I can't live like this in fear of my life. What can I do? Let's stand over here where your guard can watch us and no one can hear us. I'm so frightened. Francis, don't do anything. First of all, Carl Carson has been arrested, so he's no danger to you. Secondly, I don't believe anyone is going to call attention to themselves or to the spy ring by attacking you. So just calm down. They caught him, this Carl Carson. He's in the Wimbledon jail right now. I want to see him. What for? I want to see him. To confront him. If he killed Bill, I want to know why. If he denies it, I want him to tell it to me right to my face. Francis, he'll deny everything. Anyway, I don't know if they'll permit you to see him. Well, people visit prisoners all the time. After they've been convicted. But why see him? I want to. Face to face. I thought you just said you were going to put all this behind you. Well, all right. I'll give it a try. I'll talk to the inspector. But don't be surprised if they say no. Can you find out today? Now? If the inspector is in, I'll talk to him. And when will you let me know? Well, I have to go up to London tomorrow morning as usual. I'll, I'll phone you from the station. Oh, no, no, don't telephone. I'll meet you there. Uh, 7.45, before the train gets in, all right? By the newspaper kiosk? Francis, I wish you weren't so determined to go through with this. It's, it's almost ghoulish. I have my reasons. You're not thinking of something mad, are you? Shooting the man or something. You'll never get away with it hard to make you understand. You know, there wasn't any love between Bill and me. But I still want to see this through. It's like putting a marker on his grave. If that's the man who did it, I just want to look at him. Once. Oh, Robert. 
What leads, Ham? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, oh that is bad news. Uh, did you say six of them? Oh, my lord, I was hoping this list of our agents hadn't yet been transmitted to the other side. Oh, what I mean is, when Mrs. Jackson brought me that list, I hoped her husband hadn't yet passed the information along. Six men. Oh, terrible. Which ones? Ah. Uh-huh. Oh, two by umbrella dart. Ah. Uh, strangled. Oh, motorcycle accident. Terrifying. They must have got to them right away. No, we have nothing definite yet, sir, on that. Yes, sir. Good night, sir. I learned later that six of our men had met death the same day, each in the country to which he was assigned. All the work of Jackson and his list. It was something I could not and would not pass along to his widow. The following morning, I was at the Brighton station. The eight o'clock for London will leave Brighton on time. Francis, over here. Oh, good morning, Everett. I was awake all night thinking about this. What did the inspector say? Did you reach him? I spoke to him last night. He said he saw no reason whatsoever why you should not have a talk with Carl Carson. He might even welcome it to prove his innocence. When did the inspector say when? I didn't set a time. I thought you'd arrange that yourself. I told him I was meeting you at the 8 o'clock train, and I'd tell you... And what time do you get back from London this evening? Well, I, I plan to stay over, actually. It's two days before we go to press, and there's always last-minute work to be done on the magazine. It's only that... I mean, if this man is, y you know... A murderer? I... I just don't want to see him alone. They're not going to let the two of you be in a room alone. Whatever made you think that? There's a screen barrier between the prisoners and the public, and there'll be guards everywhere. Well, it's not that. It's just that I'm not as brave as I thought I was. I need you. Of course, I understand. It's, it's too much for you. I wish you hadn't thought of it in the first place. Besides, supposing Carl Carson says no... Why don't you wait till the day after tomorrow? Then I'll be here for the weekend and we can go together to discuss it a little more. Francis, it, it really might be harmful to you. But if I decide to, you will go with me? Yes, of course. You will. Thank you. I, I, I just won't feel it's all resolved, you see, until I do. No, here's my train. I'll stop by your house Saturday morning. Parker, Parker, wait. Inspector, what is it? Oh, I'm glad you told me where you'd be. Oh, no, Inspector, I... I, I can't talk to you now. I miss my train. Don't go, Parker. Carl Carson has escaped from jail. No, uh, which way is the main airport office? Right in front of us with the main hangar behind it. Now hold it. Hold it, Inspector. There's something wrong here. I'll go in the front door. Is there a back way out? Yes, there is. Carson's inner office, which opens into the hangar... Now, wait, won't you? Parker, we can't wait. If he's in there, we have to take him. Well, don't you notice? There's absolutely no activity on the field. Most of the planes are not here. That's a flying wing to the right of the main hangar, but nobody's in sight. Nothing's coming in or taking off. Huh. I have a feeling there's no one in here. The door to Carson's office is open. Huh. There's no one in there, either. He's had four hours hit out. He could have taken off in a plane and gone anywhere. We made a thorough search. We were sorry we did. Outside, lying right in front of the flying wing, was Carl Carson. Or rather, what was left of him. It was inconceivable to me that a man who'd lived so much of his life around airplanes could have deliberately walked into a propeller. So, you don't think it was an accident? No, no, it's not possible. He must have been ready to take off with that woman we met, that Olivia, and then gone round to check something, and whoever it was hit the automatic starter, and that was it. The prop started to spin. Someone started it up. Hmm. He's got extra fuel tanks all filled. And, and look there. What? Special instruments for high-altitude flying. Now, wait a sec. There's a map here. Huh. He was on his way to Moscow. The Sheremetyevo Airport. He's got a red circle around it. You think he was intentionally cut down? Well, I'm sure of it. 
that assistant of Olivia, she was probably an NKVD agent assigned to watch car, just the way chauffeurs are assigned to keep tabs on Soviet diplomats. Wonder where that Olivia is? Oh, well, she'll turn up. I'd better put in a call to MI5 to close off this entire facility. Until they get here, I have my men surrounded. There's more here than police ought to be responsible for. I guess now we'll never know whether it was Carson who pushed Jackson out of the train or not. Yes, you're right. No one will ever know, except the person who did it, if he's alive. Until now, this account of the fifth man was secret. But since I am no longer a member of Britain's Secret Service, I've received permission to tell you that I, as Everett Parker, used that cover for my real job, that of an MI5 operative. We knew Jackson was passing secrets to the Soviet, and that his courier was Carl Carson. I was commended for handling the case, specifically for transferring Carl's fingerprints to that door handle, my own technique. The chief told me, though, if there was a next time, I had better use a portable laser beam pocket-sized. Today, I understand they could have lifted my fingerprints from the door handle, even though I'd worn gloves to push Jackson off the train. Strictly speaking... A spy can only be sentenced to death by a military tribunal in time of war. However, the fifth man was more of a one-man fifth column. He did not conduct espionage in the strict sense of the word. Having obtained a government position of trust, he betrayed that trust and therefore died the death of a traitor. MI5 saw to that. I shall return shortly. and disguise have an ancient history. The fifth column was a sizable army inside the Trojan horse. Joan of Arc was betrayed by an Englishman disguised as a French bishop. And over the centuries, many, many more. And who were the great, great grandfathers of espionage? Cardinal Richelieu, Frederick the Great, Napoleon, Alexander the Great. The list will never end for it will reach far into the future. So long as men and countries possess dangerous secrets, other men and other countries will try to steal them. Our cast included Norman Rose, Bernard Grant, Lloyd Batista, and Marion Seltis. <laughs> 